Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. A very warm welcome to the Humanitarian Policy Group. My name is Sorsha O'Callaghan. I'm the director of HPG, and welcome to this event where we're going to speak about humanitarian dilemmas in major emergencies in 2021. And who better to join us to talk about these issues than the Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Mr. Martin Griffiths? Very welcome, uh, welcome to this discussion. And also Dr. Orzala Lemet, who is uh, a long-standing academic from Afghanistan, a research associate of SOAS, and the director of the Afghanistan Research and Evidence Unit. Welcome, Orzala. It's fantastic to have you both here with us. So just a few words about this topic. Uh, first of all, we know that it's not a new topic. We know that humanitarian action is always fraught with difficulties and dilemmas. You know, and at its very core and at its essence, humanitarian action is about responding to those most in need. So it's about judgments about who to support, um, who to prioritize, and in acute situations, these can involve matters of, of life and death, but there are wider issues too. There's issues around the politics, the purpose, and the focus of humanitarian action in situations where humanitarian assistance can be heavily politicized, it can be co-opted by armed actors and controlled for certain populations and directed to certain areas, or it's often a fig leaf for political inaction in specific contexts. None of this is new, and we can all point to Bosnia, Sri Lanka, Darfur for, for evidence of that. But it seemed to us that this year, with Afghanistan and with e Ethiopia rapidly escalating in terms of the crisis there and the ongoing crises in Yemen and Syria, that these issues are very much at the forefront and they're made particularly acute by the current geopolitical uh, geopolitical environment where there's a real an kind of impasse at uh, the Security Council um, and a real questions about multilateral international cooperation. So there's lots to discuss. Um, and I want to turn, first of all, to you, Martin. Um, You've visited a number of these crises and contexts over the last few months, um, and you've obviously been actively engaged in, in Syria, in Afghanistan, and a number of, of these crises over many, many years. I wanted to first ask you about uh, overall trends and overall issues and the factors giving rise to those, and whether you see you know, any differences, any difficulties, or any factors that you would you would like to point to. Thanks a lot, Sorcha, and thanks for inviting me. And also, very good to be with you, with you here with Rosala. Thank you very much for this chance. It's a long time since I was with the HPG, but I think I was an associate of yours many, many years ago. So thanks a lot for this. And I'm glad you, you know, your introduction is very interesting to me because I was, I've also been musing as to whether, you know, when when I say now something like it's never been as difficult as this, you never quite know because I think we tend to, we probably said that quite quite often. Um, and so it's difficult to step back uh, to know um, whether it's, it is as difficult as this. It's a bit like the, the claims that are made uh, by people like us, for people like me on my side, for this is the worst humanitarian situation in the world. Well, you can, you know, I, I, I've been in quite a few of those competing for that honorable title one way or another. It's Yemen, it's Syria, it's now it's Afghanistan, now it's Ethiopia, you know. And I think the truth is, in terms of the trends and patterns, it is very difficult and it is highly politicized. I'm now based in New York normally, and um, the amount of time that I and colleagues of mine have to spend with the Security Council is a huge increase um, over years before. And as you say, those specific crises being the focus, Ethiopia, Syria, and Afghanistan being the focus. So it is very, very much in the public domain and international attention. Um, it's no surprise in a way that the humanitarian um, uh, engagement with the Taliban, with, the Af with Afghanistan is the first off the block and is, the, is, a, is slightly a bit of a test case for what may come later, and perhaps we can come back to that later. So as the Secretary General said to me 
after I had had the uh, privilege of visiting Kabul in early September, you know, it's it's useful because the international community has at least now something to focus on in its discussions about Afghanistan, and it is that it is us. It's the humanitarian enterprise. Um, with this increased attention comes, of course, problems. Um, it's it's more and more the case, and it's it's been a banality for some time, but it's more and more obviously the case that uh, that access, aid access to people in need is more and more politicized. And, you know, Ethiopia is a very good example of that, as if we needed to go elsewhere. But, you know, so is Syria, where access to people in need with, with the relevant um, supplies and cash and assistance is conditioned of course, by you know the local, the de facto people in the northwest, but also by the Syrian government in the rest of Syria, and also, by the way, by the donors with their conditionality. So, in, you know, going from A to B with a, humanitarian assistance and protection, even more complicated, is really, really difficult. And you you have serious um, considerations as to what to do about it, how much to speak out. I, I, you know, I was being always worked very closely with Jan Egeland, and when the NRC got suspended in Ethiopia, along the same time as MSF, um, this would have been about last July, wasn't it? Jan um, decided to kind of stay quiet about it uh, while he tried to work out a suspension of the suspension, if you like. Um, and then when it didn't, when we we all tried this and it didn't work, and he said, "Okay, I think I should have spoken out in the first place." Um, and by the way, he, he said, and I've, or maybe that, this was me saying, other agencies don't step up very often uh, with solidarity at moments like that, because most, most humanitarian agencies have the first imperative, which is remaining and staying and delivering, to go that cliche. So solidarity of advocacy is problematic. I um, give, give you an example, just perhaps, well, it's very current. Anyway, yesterday I was uh, involved in the launch of this 2022 global plan stuff. And I did some media around that. And in one media interview, I talked about the, the prospects of a fracturing of Ethiopia. And I was immediately, you know, it was immediately, I was immediately made to understand that this was a bit of a worry. You don't in the UN say something like that about a major state, Africa or elsewhere. So in the later part of the day, I was saying, well, you know, something not quite so. In other words, I pulled back to say, we need Ethiopia to survive. So it's a constant, it was kind of all over with us, but it's a really much more difficult calculation now about speaking out. And indeed, the chilling effect of um, visas not being given or staff being thrown out or agencies being suspended. There is complete immunity to this, uh, to this impunity. There is complete, there is a complete impunity. I was look, thinking about this the other day, I was in Addis. And I had a meeting with um, diplomats and one of the diplomats said, have you got guarantees from your meetings with the government of Ethiopia for safe access? And I looked at him and the thought went through my head. I said, I've never had guarantees of safe. I mean, are you kidding? What, what, you know, what, what are you smoking? And of course I haven't. I've got promises, guarantees, they will come and go by the day. So I think we're, we're dealing with a very uncertain political environment. Um, and it, it's, it's, you know, many, many governments um, don't give a damn if the Security Council issues a statement saying this or that. Doesn't, you know, we brush it straight off. So we have very little, it would be very little in our pocket to, to fight back and to insist on our rights. I think, therefore, as I conclude from this, we have to be much smarter at issues of access and negotiation. I'm setting up um, um, to expand the capacity here in Geneva, actually with an OCHA on that, in line with this special advisor on humanitarian space. And secondly, we need to, to spend more time focusing on smart, what is smart advocacy? Back to you. That's really fascinating. And there's so much in there um, to pick up on, but maybe to pick on, first of all, this issue of, I guess, you know, the really difficult balance between access on the one hand um, and protection and perhaps advocacy on the other. And we know that this is not a kind of an either or, but if we look at Ethiopia, perhaps as the most um, recent example, there is there is a tension there. Um, and, you know, I think from 
our point of view in HPG, we've been doing some work looking at, at protection advocacy, and we're calling this the, the age of silence um, very much, that aid agencies you know, feel very pressurized to, to remain silent in, in situations of, of mass atrocities because they know the risks. Um, but at the same time, kind of wider protection activities, whether it's kind of visits to, to areas of detention or monitoring human rights, um, or doing, you know, the protection side of humanitarian action is also heavily impacted. Um, and so it's often a real tension and a real compromise um, for aid agencies. Um, with then questions, I guess, about complicity. Um, you know, I think there were charges, um, quite public charges about aid agencies in Myanmar about why they were being so silent. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, what you see, and it's, this isn't a judgment, there's no right or wrong, but at what point is there an unacceptable compromise or a price to pay to act? For access? <coughs> and I think, you know, we saw this in Syria where access was so acutely compromised in, in many contexts. And I'm wondering, you know, where you see the balance there and what examples kind of would you, would you bring to bear in relation to that? I think it is, as you say, Sartre, it's, a, it's it's so subjective, isn't it? Or it becomes, it's treated subjectively. So the judgments that a, different agencies make about when to, when to speak out with all the consequences of probably less access coming up. Um, how many weeks do we have to go by without the trucks going into Tigray without uh, speaking out? And, 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 and I've been up and down that road for, for the last five, six months. Um, I must say, I have noticed that um, when I did speak out on access to Tigray, just to take that specific example, because it's a very easy one to understand, I think, I didn't make any difference. You know, I, I went to the media and I spoke out and I spoke to representatives of the government of Ethiopia. It didn't, didn't, didn't lead to more access, by the way. It just led to some staff being expelled, um, for which I was then blamed by the prime minister of Ethiopia. Um, for having caused these expulsions, which was, you know, quite a reach, I thought. So it's if you look at it from the way agencies in it, in it understandably do, which is about consequences and be able to do your job. Public public advocacy in the humanitarian domain, very different from human rights, obviously, is is very um, is very is, is very difficult to to see the consequences. I think you're right about this: a time of silence. Um, and I think that's related, isn't it? I'm sure you would be saying to the to the um, uh, willingness of authorities and de facto authorities. You know, the Houthis or you know the TPLF have not exactly been helpful recently to to respond with with uh, merciless um, responses. So, advocacy, if you wanted to make a difference, is is difficult. We don't have the tradition of human rights where Advocacy is is part of the DNA, isn't it, of human rights work? It starts with public thing. We don't we don't have that. Humanitarian work is, in some sense, all about compromise, and it's a very diff, much more difficult operation than certain others for development or so forth. So I think that's that's the case. But um, there are there must be lines. There must be lines. And I know I'm you know Afghanistan. Um, you know, presents that to us. I want to say a word about donors in a second, but um, for example, were we not to have a re reasonable level of women involved in humanitarian um, in humanitarian operations, you know, one of the promises the Taliban gave us, not women involved in the broader society, that's a whole much more difficult. I'm sure Azala will tell us about this. Were we not to have that, we almost certainly wouldn't, shouldn't, couldn't operate, for example. So I think there are red lines. It's, it was in Kabul, by the way, and I know you know this, but in the run up or in those first days of the Taliban takeover, for the agencies in Kabul to come to an agreement on red lines was impossible, by the way. They were able to come to an agreement on principles, but consequences, i.e. red lines, impossible. And I just had a chat here with Philippa Grandi, we're talking about future in Afghanistan. And 
And he said, we should be very careful in our world about red lines. He said, he said I don't use the word red lines because then you're, you, you know, impose your own conditionality. Donors, I find, are a puzzle. Um, and also, you know, very demanding of our time and attention, of course, because they pay for us, as they keep reminding us. Um, very difficult to keep a balance in my job between uh, attention to donors and attention to the rest of the world um, and all those member states that I'm supposed to be working with. But donors, the imposition of donor views, they, they, there's very little embarrassment, uh, I find, in terms of a whole, a whole range of donors about imposing their political views. I was listening yesterday to, in one of those launches, to a very good speech actually by Samantha Power of the AID in which she talked about the need sometimes to work even where governments are unacceptable and therefore, you know, use aid to go directly without going through state structures, which we all know is inefficient. But it's the government is unacceptable bit of that sentence that I find quite hard to cope with. Um, you know, they are their taxpayers' money, so they, they, they understandably impose their conditions. But I think one of the problems the one of the crippling problems of Syria has been donor conditionality. Syria is worse off now than it has been for 10 years uh, and it's getting worse every year. It's unaffordable, it's unacceptable, and a large part of that is conditionality. And that's before we even get to sanctions. Over to you. Well, thank you again. There's so much there and I really want to come back to this issue of, of smarter advocacy and um, you know, the, the steps that you're taking in terms of setting up this new unit, but perhaps we can hold it there and, and bring Orzala into the conversation, because I think you also touched, Martin, on the issue of, of aid conditionality um, and Afghanistan. And Orzala, obviously the political and economic uh, events in Afghanistan, some of these aren't new, but I think the Taliban takeover um, has really magnified um, some of the, the, the tensions and, and the difficulties. Um, and it's, it's brought them to the fore, to the point where we're now facing a real you know, catastrophe in Afghanistan. I'm wondering, you know, these issues of, of humanitarian dilemmas, what issues do you see currently in Afghanistan from your point of view? And we've been talking, I think, quite a bit about international actors um you know whether you see and what differences you see perhaps between um national and international actors thank you very much sorcha good uh good afternoon uh good morning or good evening to all the listeners uh and viewers it's a great honor to be part of this panel um in a timely uh, uh space i would say uh, with regards to Afghanistan, um, as you rightly mentioned, the depth of the crisis is um, probably uh, intensified since uh, mid-August. Uh, but I have to sort of remind everyone who's uh, listening to this that the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan has been deteriorating over the years. Uh, the COVID crisis, um, conflict that has been protracted and for years ongoing, the recent drought situation, all added by the regime change since mid-August has created uh, this catastrophe that we are talking about. And in terms of the urgency of the assistance, in terms of the actions required, I think uh, as we speak, it probably is already late and we are already losing lives, unfortunately. Very briefly, to give you a picture of how situation is, um, truly through, from an economic point of view, there is a crisis going on with the banks and restrictions by the international community, and also with a complete paralysis of uh, the governance institutions in terms of delivering services, and particularly in terms of uh, providing salaries for those who are working for these governments. So I have to say people are walking to their offices every day government officials, I mean, uh, civil servants, they do go to office without having the, the, the money to pay for their transportation in Kabul or elsewhere. A very small amount has been paid out of a goodwill of some of the officials, but uh, not systematic salary payments has been made. That in itself is the reason why we see a sudden 
change of uh, quite significant uh, 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 increase in the numbers of people who are in need of food shortage or who are in need of um, uh, other uh, sort of uh, basic requirements. In terms of food security, FAO is estimating um, nine, 19 million people who are facing um, basically um, uh, acute food shortage or they are food insecure, one in two uh, in the Afghan um, population. Just to remind everyone, we are estimated to be over 38 million or so uh, uh, as a population. Another aspect of the humanitarian crisis is displacement with over half a million only this year being displaced from their homes due to conflict. Uh, health and education are to other cri critical sectors in the humanitarian assistance and they also are suffering from current economic and um, political crises with uh, half of the populations over the age of uh, women, over the age of um, 13 or 14 are not uh, are denied access to education and basic services in this regard. So this is the situation we are talking about. One of the many examples of the crises that uh, Mr. Griffin, Griffiths was also highlighting. And in terms of the dilemmas, um, I come back to probably sort of in the case of Afghanistan, give some of these dilemmas that, that we see are being sort of unpacked uh, as, we, uh, as, we, uh, as the situation is evolving. Um, I will begin also um, uh, with, with the dilemma of humanitarian aid conditionality. Um, and I'm always reminded by one um, humanitarian practitioner that I met through one of the virtual meetings who was telling me, you know, if you conditionalize, for example, uh, girls' education over provision of humanitarian aid, you're talking about whether this girl, for whose rights you are basically demanding, is making it through the winter or not. Uh, due to acute hunger, due to lack of uh, access to health facilities and uh, food security. So that's a very simple example to communicate what we are talking about, really. Um, uh, throughout our networks, we try to sort of make this spread, not only through the donors uh, or international organizations and so forth, but even Afghans and diaspora, that they have to just take action immediately now before it is too late to just continue send and transfer money to families that they know because the crisis is serious and it's really real. Um, so conditionality is a dilemma for, for, for certain you know, political donors or states in terms of you know, finding themselves in this dilemma of what to prioritize of, over what. Another issue is this role of uh, female aid workers. In Afghanistan, again, this is also partly related to attention that is partly related to the question of conditionality. At the very beginning, there were stronger restrictions and probably fears, uh, to be very honest with you, uh, by female aid workers attending the offices and attending their jobs, basically. Slowly and contextually, this, this has changed in some parts, whereas in, in some parts like Kabul, the, the capital and se several major cities, there are still quite strong restrictions and limitations. And so how to really do? The first and the most sort of neediest people are women who are in need of humani urgent humanitarian aid. Women and children are the most vulnerable ones. If you don't have female aid workers, how to ensure that you're reaching them? So you're faced with a sort of a ruling force that is not really ready to, to, to accept these conditionalities. The best way so far has been, you know, internal or contextual negotiations and convincing through earning trust of each other to really like do the job. And I think that's how uh, Afghans have addressed it. And I mean, but it requires more sort of um, understanding in knowledge. Another dilemma I would like to sort of talk here about is this question of local versus uh, international um, actors uh, in the area of humanitarian uh, aid and assistance. And we see that there is a lot of um, action by the international uh, uh, organization, whereas the limitations are there for local organizations, both have their strengths and weaknesses. And interestingly enough, in the case of Afghanistan, I can say that the, the, they are complementing each other. The local vibrant, active uh, organizations of civil society, the NGOs, are quite capable of delivering this aid and of be, strengthening the sort of downwards accountability with population under the surveillance and support of the sort of international aids. International aids are probably good in terms of earning the trust of the international actors, and to some extent, probably the authorities, 
but maybe they don't have the possibility or the luxury of reaching the far and remote areas that are in more need of assistance. So therefore, I think this also needs to be addressed in some ways. And unfortunately, I have to say here, I have seen very little action being taken in terms of bringing in the Afghan civil society into the picture of provi provision of humanitarian aid. We are in this conflict for over 40 years and in, in the history of this 40 years, every time there was a dysfunctional or sort of relatively weak government, we had stronger civil society who, who came forward and, and offered that help. And that has to be sort of counted on in a careful way, of course. We don't want to create permanent sort of replacements for the state institutions, but we are talking about uh, emergency situation at the moment. Finally, last but not least, I would like to highlight a, a, another tension, which is this tension between humanitarian assistance, which has its urgency in the development assistance. Um, maybe this not, not, uh, now is not the time to hear talk about the aid dependency and all that, but the, the importance of continuous uh, development assistance is, is critical at this time because lack of development assistance directly leads into this crisis that we are talking about by denying people jobs, by denying people resources from a very local micro level to the macro level. So that dilemma needs to be addressed in terms of you know, immediate response and the longer term response. So I probably am coming to the end of my, uh, my uh, time uh, allocation, but I would like to sort of say here that as currently as a researcher and a, as a, a leader of a think tank, I'm, I'm feeling less um, a sort of um, embarrassed to, to be part of these excellent panels and conversations, but I cannot um, um, emphasize enough about the importance of taking actions in this time. Unfortunately, as someone who observes the situation, particularly on the humanitarian field, whenever I try to reach out to uh, those I know and ask that, am I being isolated? or neglected from this process? Or is there no process actually to talk about in terms of actions, what we need uh, to do now in terms of you know, the, the, the place of the civil society, if donors are talking among each other about the future of Afghanistan and not including civil society voices, not including people's voices, it is a little bit concernable looking at the back uh, history. Um, so uh, I just end with that, that action is most urgent in terms of coming together and finding the best and more permanent solutions to the crisis that we are facing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ar Arzala. There's a, a long list of, of issues there, but maybe to touch in on this issue of um, action. Um, and I guess where we are currently in relation to Afghanistan is just there's an impasse um, between what are very much kind of incompatible objectives on the part of the international community you know, don't want to recognize uh, the new Taliban government at the same time, you know, um, have all of these sanctions, which are slowly um, meaning that the, there's a rapid economic uh, decline in Afghanistan and a, and a rapidly escalating humanitarian emergency. Um, but also um, humanitarian agencies and other actors are completely constrained by a, a financial crisis, which means that they can't scale up operations. And um, Martin, you mentioned uh, Syria and donor conditionality in Syria, but we've got a very similar situation, um, you know, unfolding in Afghanistan. And there's been a number of questions um, in the chat asking about, you know, are we doing enough? Um, we know that a number of actors have come out, WFP have come out very strongly, ICRC have said this is a man-made crisis. Um, you know, Samantha Power, you were saying yesterday, is talking about kind of doing, un engaging with um, unrecognized governments. Is there more you think humanitarians can do to press for action to highlight um, the consequences of, of this impasse? Yeah, thank you, Sorcha. I think, I would urge everyone who hasn't done so to read an interview with Peter Mara, I think about 10 days ago in the national newspaper in Abu Dhabi. I think he must have been there for a, a workshop. And he, he talks quite a lot about this issue with relationship to Afghanistan and Syria and Yemen to a lesser extent. And he, he he's essentially saying, and I, I, no, no, I totally take my instructions from Peter on all such matters. He's essentially saying, 
the world shouldn't rely on the humanitarians to deliver um, more than what the humanitarians are supposed to deliver. We are not the we are not the, the placebo. We're not the excuse. If you want to aid the people of Afghanistan, just as just as we were hearing just now, uh, in fact, um, from Orzala, you, you need to get involved in different kinds of funding and different kinds of stabilization. And don't don't look to us to rescue you from your conscience kind of thing. And if you if you the world for good or bad reasons don't want um, uh, there to be further implosion of Afghanistan, further economic collapse, and then for outflows and so forth, get in the game and 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 get get moving on other forms of funding um, and other forms of engagement. So, and I think he's completely right. And I think there is because of the international attention and the polarization in these political crises, the ones that we're discussing. The humanitarian is taken a bit too far. You know, the humanitarian is an easy one, and it's bad for us because there's a tendency, which I think we, which, which, which I see, you know, in my day job, that the humanitarian agencies will say, "Well, we'll take a, we'll take on more responsibilities into development, right? Uh, because the development funding isn't available, or they're slow, or you know, it's not available because it's con conditional, whereas ours is unconditional. So we take on more. I think that way lies perdition." I think in a sense, precisely because of the challenges that you were describing earlier, we need to be more pure and more kind of back to basics than before, rather than growing, mopping up these extra things. What that means, I think very specifically in Afghanistan um, is that I think there is a need for um, an international plan of uh, which sets out a set of expectations from the international community. I mean, you know, you can see that I come from the UN when I say things like this, um, from the international community of the Taliban. And we know what they are. They are to, to do with inclusion rights, anti-terrorism, blah, blah, blah. And that as, and, and I totally get Rosala's point about the involvement of Afghan civil society in drafting this, by the way, and in monitoring it and involved in this. But in return for which, uh, if there is progress on these things, that then there will be different kinds of levels of international engagement. The next one after, I think, after post-humanitarian, as it were, and it won't be linear, is uh, putting money through state structures. Um, and, you know, this is debated. You can differentiate it from Taliban if you're careful, and you can even maybe begin to manage it, but it'll be a political, I know from my own discussions, whoever says it's a political hot potato, but we need this plan because otherwise what's going to happen is the humanitarians get stretched. We won't be able to do what we need to do for the health, health uh, structures or education structures or any other structures for the, for the people of Afghanistan, and they will be the first to suffer. We must hold, as much as we hold the international, uh, the Taliban accountable, let's try to do the same for us, for our side, for the member states. Rosella, do you want to come in on that. Uh, we've got loads of questions in the chat, but I think, um, you know, you obviously know Afghanistan very well and you've been engaging very deeply in the developments there. And I'm wondering, if you want to respond directly to that and then we can open up um, to the to the audience. Um, most of the points have been covered. Uh, what I would like to sort of say in terms of uh, what uh, uh, Martin have just mentioned in terms of the urgency for the need of having a plan. This crisis was coming, uh, Martin, I'm sure uh, your colleagues uh, and the UN already had these. We are a very small think tank and we already had our business continuity plan and foreseeing what was uh, to, to come. And maybe it took a lot of our population by surprise, but not necessarily those who were watching the situation. So I think it's already late. And I think, again, I cannot emphasize enough on one uh, to urgently operationalize this idea of having a plan for the humanitarian assistance and also not forget the importance of a longer term uh, uh, support to Afghanistan through other means, non-humanitarian. I very much appreciate the fact that not entire responsibility of saving Afghanistan's future should be on the shoulder of the humanitarian actors here. Uh, we need everything, but at the moment we, we prioritize food is the first. We say in mm. Afghanistan mm. being a war front, we say mm. that without 
eating, you cannot do anything, you cannot function. So let's feed the, the country first and then come to those other uh, priorities as well. And again, the second is really to, uh, like I mentioned, to, to involve Afghans there. The population of Afghanistan, like I said, over 38 million should not pay for the mistakes of the former regime or for the restrictions of the current regime, really. As an Afghan, I would like to carry this message to the world. Uh, we are not at fault. Uh, the problems, uh, if we dig further on what happened and why it happened, there is a shared responsibility among all, and I say this all in a capital way, actors involved. Every one of us have to so sort of own the share of this responsibility of coming to this point. But we owe it to the, to the innocent civilians of the country to sort of find a solution. So I think Action is again the, the headline that I would like to sort of communicate through this um, in, 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 a, in a more urgent way. And um, engagement is also critical. Uh, in ha a number of times here, we were highlighting the question of you know, politicization of humanitarian aid. I'm in full agreement that we have to avoid it. We know every, every act is political act, even provision of humanitarian aid can be also political. I, I, I'm studying that in the school, of course, we are all. Are, but now we, we have to sort of see how we can succeed in depoliticizing the, 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 the depth of a catastrophe that we are seeing unpacking in, our, in front of our eyes. And there has been enough you know, experiences from other countries that we should sort of certainly look at in, uh, and avoid it. Uh, and also we, uh, for us in Afghanistan, just to sort of bring uh, this example from the past, this is not the first time Taliban are ruling Afghanistan. Taliban are the same Taliban, according to themselves, of the 90s. So we have seen what really resulted in, in a productive way or non-productive way and how we can draw upon those lessons to, to lead the way forward. Yeah. One thing I want to touch upon, you both mentioned it in, in various ways, um, and it's come up in the in the questions as well, um, is the issue of, I guess, red lines in terms of, of women's rights, the involvement of, of female aid workers in the delivery of assistance that we all know is so essential to reaching Afghan women. Um, you mentioned, Martin, that you don't find um, kind of the, the use of red lines, perhaps particularly helpful. Um, and I think um, one thing I've been struck upon, um, Orzala, in the, the discussions I've been having about um, Afghanistan and women's rights is that, you know, it's become this major political leverage on both sides in terms of international actors and donors really placing an emphasis on this. Um, um, and the new Taliban government also, um, you know, it's almost becoming this hot issue. Um, and I'm wondering how helpful that is when you mention the fact that there is a need for trust and incremental um, progress um, in relation to some of these issues. So I guess how, how would you suggest these issues of um, and if the involvement of female aid workers and women's rights more, more generally are, are treated. Um, and to what degree do you feel red lines, you know, are appropriate by maybe some aid actors? How would you, how would you suggest? Maybe Martin, over to you first. Um, okay. I think you raised the issue first and then perhaps to Arzala. Thank you very much, Sorcha. I think, I think the problem is the humanitarian community is, is, has difficulty with red lines. Um, as much as me, as it were. I mean, we 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 have difficulty agreeing on them. Um, and Afghanistan, as you say, is a sort of perfect terrain of battle for this. Um, what we what we have been trying to do in Afghanistan since the beginning of September is to monitor with a whole set of indicators of humanitarian space. You know, the promises that were made to me and turning those into indicators, which includes women's uh, um, freedom to, to work in that sector, independence of monitoring and delivery, not being, um, you know, not having uh, recruitment done by, you know, of staff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we've been monitoring that monthly. And the overall trend is quite, uh, is quite positive. But I mean, I would, I would clearly limit that. To, this is only about humanitarian action. And it doesn't actually confront the wider, more difficult issues that uh, Orzala and you have been discussing. The, the, the role of women in society, 
um, women in education, for example, um, is much more problematic. So I think, first of all, um, I, th I would strongly be a fundamentalist about making humanitarian action as unconditional as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I try to make that argument, I'm sure we all do very strongly to, to donors, for example, just to remind them that this, this, this is the, this is, this is a key privilege of humanitarian action and has been established by international humanitarian law for, for many, many years, by the way, in parenthesis, that has something to say about whether we should have got a cross-border resolution over Syria, a whole, whole conversation about that. Um, so that's the first thing. I think the, the difficulty comes when we go, we, the world goes to those other forms of engagement with the Taliban. And which we have to do, I think, or as I was right, we're late already. Um, we've been trying to get this roadmap or plan moved quickly. And when I go to key member states, they say, well, of course, you know, we actually believe in the rights of women and girls, and therefore you will not expect us to, to you know, step up. And, and that conversation is too glib. It's too superficial. And it's like that, that argument about it, you know, it's fighting a battle to the last Afghan. Um, as opposed to the last person from that government. So the conversation about the rights and inclusion and freedom of movement and freedom of expression has to be central to international engagement. I don't, I would say that too, but it's, it's to do with other forms of engagement, other forms of assistance. For the humanitarians, we need to operate. You, the points that you made at the top of the, or top of the discussion. For the, for the rest, we need also to be liberated. And I think that's, crucial and has to be done and we should and and by the way i think the taliban um is i mean i negotiated with the taliban in 1998 for example on behalf of the un and it was a, pretty much a disaster it, we can see the difference now it's certainly not you know it's not sweden or or, or or switzerland yet but it's it's different from 1998 so we should be using that sort of conditionality i think we can in education for example this is my personal prejudice over Thank you, Martin. Um, Orzala, do you want to come in on this point in terms of, um, yeah, I guess, conditionality and red lines and, um, and how to manage this and what lessons, I guess, we've learned from the 1990s um, in terms of, of women's rights and um, women's involvement in, in aid delivery? Thank you, Sorcha. Uh, here, um, just uh, as a background, I, have, I would say that uh, back in the late 90s, uh, uh, when my, I myself was in my early 20s, I founded an organization called Humanitarian Assistance for the Women and Children of Afghanistan. So my very own career uh, in the public has begun by providing uh, help and assistance for women and children. Uh, humanitarian assistance and are slowly uh, coming to the rights and to the human rights and justice issues as we moved on. So um, as someone with, with such a background, um, the question of uh, red lines and the question of uh, 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 women's rights for me is whether I say it out loud as an individual or not, it's, it's a natural question that comes out. And as an Afghan, I said it before, and I'm sure uh, everyone listened to that, and I, I would like to also remind everyone here that the struggle for women's rights in Afghanistan did not begin in 2001, uh, nor will it end in the August 15 of 2021. We have seen uh, the streets of Kabul, uh, we have seen uh, different uh, efforts from within the country, uh, from Herat to Badakhshan to, to, to North, East, South, West, of how a campaigns, a very, very grassroots local men campaign for women uh, education, for girls education is running on. Uh, one ex small example is this volunteer um, group that is called Pinpath, and they are now uh, going around the villages in Afghanistan the morning. So the changes are there, and I believe in terms of gaining our rights that are denied by the current authorities is something that is a matter of time and with pressure of people that will be possible to see girls going back to school and to see uh, uh, girls women getting back to their jobs and uh, adult girls also going back and having access to university so uh, i think in this particular point i fully support the position 
of humanitarian actors to separate the humanitarian assistance from such kind of red lines from the other struggle. Having said that, these two struggles have to work and move in a parallel way. Yeah. I cannot wait the one for the other. Uh, like I say, the urgency of humanitarian aid is there. But like I said, if the women have the jobs, earn the salary, why will they become hungry and in need of the WFP food packages? Simple as this. So both has to move on. From the side of the people and community, I have to say the same way, uh, 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 Martin, you have mentioned that the Taliban may be not exactly the same Taliban of 1980s. I think the same way the Afghan population are also not the 1980s population. They are not scared of the bullets or the bombs and so forth. So there will be a, a very constructive form of resistance built within the country, and that will result into this change that I'm personally optimistic in the upcoming uh, years. That's great to great to hear. Orzala, I'm going to try and pull together. There's a, about 25 different questions um, at wow. the moment in the in the chat. I'm going to try and pull out some strands. Um, one of them is, a, is, I guess, a question more back to you, Martin, in relation to um, the politicization of uh, humanitarian action um, and the, the use by donors or member states about the punitive use of, of red lines and sanctions and how much further we can go. Um, and another question that came in as to whether you could talk more about um, the, the issue of having to manage donors um, and um, you know, appreciating your frankness in relation to that, um, and what are some of the difficulties that you would point to? Um, I think like, there's a question to you, Orzala, around the role of, of Afghan organizations and, and local actors, um, and whether, you seeing, whether you're seeing that they have greater legitimacy or, or greater access um, than perhaps international actors, how you're seeing that complementarity playing out. And I think there are also lots of questions about the tensions between um, aid delivery, advocacy and protection. And I think there is a, um, a concern, I think, that we in HPG would share um, that sometimes the focus on what can be sometimes very ad hoc access for one aid delivery comes at a real price in terms of ac access to undertake more protection activities or to engage with um, you know, the real atrocities that are happening in these crises. Um, and I think there's a, a number of questions as to whether you know, the smart access um, work that you're doing, Martin, as to, to um, you know, what that means in practice um, and you know, what are some of the uh, priorities around that. So, um, so yeah, uh, maybe first to you, to Martin, um, and then to you, Orzala. And I know, Martin, you have to, to leave at five minutes to the hour. So maybe we'll have time to come back one more time. Thanks very much. And I, of course, would strongly start by saying I love all donors and I admire them and respect them. And I think they're all absolutely perfect uh, in, in all ways. Okay, so we'll start with that on the record. Um, I think that the... To be serious about this, I think the following. Um, donors are giving a hell of a lot of money. You know, our plan for 2022 is $41 billion. My God, it's unimaginably high. So there is a, a massive, a, a, from a limited number of member states, a massive amount of money. Um, and it, is, it, it isn't surprising that along with it comes the views, their political views, and what they call the views of their taxpayers, as, as you know. So we should not be surprised at that, but nor should we be surprised at, at uh, having our own disagreement with them about the consequences of some of that, where it, where it has an impact on our principles and our freedom of action. And what I think, therefore, in a sort of proper world, it doesn't, it doesn't usually work like this, but is we have to be very, very clear. I have to be very, very clear about two, two donors and others and other member states, it's not just donors, obviously, about what these restrictive views or constraining circumstances or conditionality, what that means for the welfare of the people that we're all in, in, intending to serve. And you can look at it quite 
uh, easily in, in Syria. I had two meetings just uh, this morning in Geneva with two ambassadors from some very big donors. We were going through this in some detail, and I think you can do that. It's our job to make sure that donors understand so that they can feed that back to their populations. And by the way, we should also, just as you do, we should engage with our own taxpayers and so on and so forth. So let's not leave the argument at simply uh, by saying, oh, well, this is a conditionality, we have to deal with it. Um, because we should be challenging these conditionalities. We, we, have, a, we have an obligation and not merely a, a right. Um, I think that uh, the, the, we, we're seeing that with sanctions at the moment on Afghanistan. I think the US has done an incredibly good job carving out um, humanitarian exemption from sanctions. We're having a much more difficult job in the Security Council at the moment. And there's going to be a huge burden of reporting probably placed on us in OCHA. Um, it's quite a struggle. It's quite a struggle to get this through. And we know that some donors, for example, Canada, um, is unwilling to provide any funds to any organization in, Af in Afghanistan that will comply with the ruling that, that employees have to pay tax. Because as you, you've heard this story, it, it infringes on the thing. So this is a problem because uh, there's not a lot of choice for people in Afghanistan, but to, to, to pay what they're asked to pay. Um, so let's keep challenging that and let's let's make sure that d member states who give a lot of money understand that challenging that is not being disrespectful. It's simply doing our job. I would also add two more things. One is, and you, you know, this group I'm sure is way ahead of me on this one, but I made the point yesterday. You know, the first line of response to humanitarian assistance comes from the local communities. I saw this in Tigray vividly. IDP camps were sustained for months by local communities who sold their assets and gave their money and until they were they were themselves broke. They are very generous donors, local communities. And by the way, member states hosting refugees, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, assist humanitarian assistance is not only monetized, it's not only that. And let's let's be clear about the spread of the burden. On smart access, can I just say, say something about that? What you know, I was a conflict mediator for the last at 20 years based in Geneva, mostly mostly not in the UN, but a bit, bit in the UN. But I noticed, for example, that um, as a conflict mediator, you would need to develop ways to engage with leaders in conflict, which were not, which were not often practiced by the humanitarian community. We are, tend to be a bit blunter because we're right, right? Conflict mediator is never right. That's the whole point. They're trying to, you know, get other people to be right. So we would always look at ways to leverage people in power through different means, through advocacy sometimes, through back channels and other times, through this and the, you know all the story. I think the first smart access stuff, which we hope to, to develop ideas here in Geneva, is beginning, beginning in January, is to look at lobby, uh, let's upload the, the talent and experience that other communities have. We know in Britain, when I was back in, in, in Britain and I was part of the NGO group in Britain, we knew that the environmental campaigners were much better than, than the humanitarian campaigners when it came to lobbying for the annual uh, DFID budget. So let's go to where the cleverness is and let's, let's, let's be a lot more sophisticated about going beyond the, no, we, we have to issue a statement now, you know, because something has happened. Let's have a bit more of a plan. I would caveat all this, by saying, and you know, we know all this, but it's worth re reminding ourselves, particularly if you're in the UN, that you know, you it's very, it's sometimes very sensitive to to release ideas about what's likely to happen, contingencies that you're going to lobby on, because they're immediately taken as criticisms of you know with this or that government or this or that group. So it's not easy. Contingency planning in Ethiopia, for example, now is a fraught problem, because you're you know threatening one or other set of member states. So smart access, we can do it better, we can do it together, and we can understand you know, who is going to make a decision and how do we make that happen. It won't work too much, but for example, when would you go and see Boko Haram? Would you go to the Nigerian government first? Probably you would, but maybe you wouldn't. Well, how do we do that and what would we be asking? You know, that's kind of bedrock stuff, over. Well, I think, I mean, in terms of 
what we've been talking about and advocating from from HPG's point of view in terms of a more nuanced engagement, understanding the politics of the crisis that you're engaging in, but also the politics of humanitarian action within them as a really, you know, a fought over resource and a point of leverage between authorities, de facto authorities and the international community as they see it. Yeah. So I think understanding and situating aid within that real complexity exactly. um, and then figuring out what what is possible um, within that. And often, yeah, it won't be public statements, but it will be a much more sophisticated engagement with yes. those uh, with influence. So we were interested to see what emerges out of that. Martin, I know you have to drop off. Um, so I'm going to um, uh, say goodbye and a big thank you. I think there's been lots of um, welcoming for your frankness um, in the comments in the chat. Um, and so certainly I think um, lots to lots to think about and engage with. Orzala, we'll hopefully keep you with us uh, for a few more minutes to touch on these points about local actors. Um, there's been a number of, of questions in the chat about the relative um, uh, access that local actors have, the, the issue of trust, um, and whether you're seeing that playing out any differently um, um, in terms of local or national um, actors. Thank you, Sorcha. Um, um, I'm pleased to be given this uh, time to speak about the local actors of local organizations. Over the last uh, decades, uh, 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 as a result of international support, there has been a quite a vibrant uh, a local sort of civil society emerging. The challenge with the Afghan civil society lays with this fact. Uh, like the governments, it has been quite elite oriented in a lot of these very top level elites have already made their way out with together with their relatives out of Afghanistan. So that gives a false assumption to many partners, especially to many donors that they see the end of the world in Afghanistan, they see the end of the civil society in Afghanistan, which is not a reality. The reality is that thousands of uh, people, hundreds of local uh, uh, actual grassroots civil society are active on the ground. They are in the country, they haven't moved, they haven't been part of the evacuations of the mid-August, uh, and they are uh, ready to work um, uh, and play their role. So the challenge that they face is currently this ambiguity in terms of their uh, uh, capability or capacity to, to absorb international funding on the humanitarian sector because they always relied on these elites in the centers trying to basically mediate between them and the donors. Uh, but then they do have the potential when it comes to delivery of assistance and aid. Uh, so I see there uh, a possibility. One interesting point that uh, uh, Martin made and I would like to sort of highlight here is also this challenge of legitimacy. So what really legitimacy means? Most of the NGOs are registered uh, and there is a very, uh, systematic uh, mechanism within the Ministry of Economy of Afghanistan uh, uh, that uh, allows you to enter information from your board to management to accountability, finances, projects, everything is on the six month basis, the reporting system requires you to fill in all of that. The same way the, the revenue office of the Ministry of Finance has a taxing system and all NGOs have to pay the taxes that are required to be paid. So now these are part of, not necessarily part of the government per se, but part of the state mechanism in Afghanistan. And we ourselves as a non-governmental organization, we're faced with this question. If we start to operate, we have to pay those taxes. We have to report to the authorities. Now, who the authorities are, what their actions are, is one of those tensions that we have to really find out and address between uh, uh, Afghans and the donors and the uh, authorities and the international community. Because if you, the question is very simple, do you want to operate or you don't want to operate? If you operate, there are situations that we have to sort of find solution to it. So my message here for donors is to recognize this reality of um, uh, leadership sort of capacities, maybe not in a very sophisticated English speaking manner, but at least some capacity within the country. And I say that as an Afghan and as an English speaker Afghan, you know, that don't rely entirely on us uh, sitting outside Afghanistan, but sort of rely on find ways to rely on those who are there because that will create a shortcut 
to speed up the needs for, for the emergency situations at the moment. The rest, I think, is a matter of time and uh, requires a very constant uh, struggle from the Afghan side and also from the international side to find the way uh, to uh, get out of this situation. And, and last but not least, when it comes to the question of this tensions you were talking about, Sorcha, earlier about aid, advocacy and protection, I think to and me... And I think we'll just end here on this point because we're we're up against the hour, but please, Oops. please continue. I don't want to cut you off. Ending my sentence here to say that to me, all of them are required uh, in a very careful way and all of them are required equally to happen in parallels. Not one is replacing the other one. Uh, advocacy for rights, provision of aid, as I said, feeding the population, feeding the people, and also ensuring the protection of both humanitarian actors and the advocates is a moral obligation and responsibility of authorities, even if they are not feeling themselves responsible, but they have to sort of pay to this moral obligation and also a moral obligation of the international community to look into it. So I just end it here and thank you once again very much Sorcha for this uh, panel and for the conversation. Well, thank, thank you. I'm not going to even try to, to sum up, I guess, what I heard. We, we range from, from, from Tigray to, to Syria to Afghanistan in a perhaps more depth. But I think what struck me is, is a little bit of, of what you just said there, Orzala, is that, um, you know, Martin talked about aid should be as unconditional as possible. Um, but you've provided a very, I guess, small example of the implications of that about, you know, paying your tax as an, um, a national organization in Afghanistan and, you know, with conditionalities um, on the Afghan uh, government currently, but the dilemmas that that very small uh, issue poses for you. Um, but I also, as you mentioned, think that these are you know, many of the questions that we're talking about in terms of balancing assistance or protection or advocacy in, in highly politicized environments, it's not an either or, um, and that these things are held in balance. Um, and so I don't think we've perhaps come up with real solutions to these enduring questions, but um, thank you for shining such a spotlight on the difficulties and the issues in, Af in Afghanistan. Um, and thank you to, to all of our audience and participants for the great chat that um, I know has been um, extremely live um, and, and the great questions. And we tried to answer some of them, but um, we'll be pulling all of this into um, uh, HPG's body of work. We're planning a new body of work uh, over the next two years. And so there's very rich material and on some enduring questions for humanitarian actors. So thank you, everyone. We'll, we'll end it here. Um, and especially thank you to, to you, Dr. Orzala Namat, uh, for a really excellent conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Pleasure. Bye. Thanks.